Hello and welcome to the Squatting Puffin. Jeez, that sounds like a medieval tavern. Well, too late now. Let's plow ahead. From the notes of James McHenry from the Constitutional Convention of 1787, we find this story. A lady asked Dr. Franklin, Well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? A republic, replied the doctor, if you can keep it. If a republic is simply a representative democracy, why would one of the leading scholars of the 1700s think it would be a challenge to keep one? Today, we'll be talking about the biggest lie my American civics class has taught me, and probably taught you as well. But first, to bury the lead, let's talk about governments. In the small Eastern European country of Stikmanistan, a brand new Lazy King was crowned. This Lazy King loved spending his time counting his collection of turtles, and didn't want to waste time with unimportant matters like ruling the kingdom. So, one day he called the people together. As your king, he said, I have devised a new way for you to rule. Instead of wasting my days conferring with my counselors about matters of state, I will have them confer with you. Every day they will stand in the town square and take your suggestions, and once a week they will hold a vote to see which suggestions you all would like made into law. This way you may rule yourselves, and I may count my turtles in peace. You'll be, as the other countries call it, a democracy. But wait, shouted one man, if you will not be governing us, what will become of you? I shall remain your benevolent king. If we can just vote for whatever we want, shouted another, why can't we just vote you out and crown a new king? One that actually takes care of us. You can't vote me out, shouted the king. I gave you the vote and I can take it away. Then the people of Stikmanistan looked at each other in confusion. If they had the right to vote, it seems they are in a democracy. But if they can't vote for a better king, what kind of a democracy do they truly have? Let's talk about forms of government. But, Puffin, there are several ways that a government can be classified. You could categorize by centralization of power, such as in a unitary state, a federation, or a confederation. Or you could categorize by socioeconomic structures, such as feudalism, communism, and fascism. Yes, yes, but what we care about here is the source of power category. When categorizing by source of power, there are two points to consider. Who is the ultimate source of power, and from whence does it originate? Or, for the viewers with IQs as low as mine, who gets the last word, and why? Let's hit some examples. A monarchy is a form of government where the monarch of a noble bloodline rules, and the monarch is allowed to rule, usually because God has bestowed them with holy authority. This is especially true in the United Kingdom, where their monarch is both the head of state and the head of church. A theocracy is just a monarchy, minus the noble bloodline and plus holy guidance to the holy religious leader who wholly decides everything. A dictatorship is just a monarchy, minus noble bloodline and minus holy authority, but plus lots of military that make up the difference as far as the peasants are concerned. An oligarchy is also a common structure, from the Greek oligos meaning few and arco meaning to rule. This few has been everything from the powerful business oligarchs of Ukraine to the dominant ethnic minority of apartheid South Africa. And throughout history, oligarchies have relied on similar sources of power as dictators to maintain control. And of course, we have democracy. Democracy is also Greek, coming from demos meaning the people, and kratos meaning rule. Or in other words, the people rule. This is where whatever the majority decides upon is law, and this is often understood through a vote of some sort. And where does its source of power come from? The fact that there's more people in the majority than in a minority, by definition. So the minority is kept in check by the might of the majority. But Poffin, in Stikmanistan, the majority didn't have ultimate power because they couldn't vote out the king. Don't interrupt, I'm getting there. Just by having some features of a democracy, such as the vote, does not mean that a government is a democracy. When the majority vote is not the ultimate authority, it relegates that to an adjective in the form of government. Our example of Stikmanistan would be a democratic monarchy. Democratic because there is power in the voice of the people, but ultimately still a monarchy because the monarch maintains the final say. I know for all three of my viewers, hi by the way, I should really take time to learn your names if I'm going to be as popular as the meatloaf lunch at the cafeteria, this probably seems pretty simple, but so many people in America think we live in a democracy without really understanding this basic principle. 
And now we get to republics. In my civics classes, and indeed in every civics textbook I've ever read, I learned that republic comes from the Latin rex publica. Rex, like in Tyrannosaurus Rex, means king. And publica is, well, the public. So rex publica means the public is king. So the ultimate power lies in the hands of the public. But it is exercised through a representative. One might call it a representative democracy. But Puffin, that would mean that a republic isn't a form of government at all. We just called it a representative democracy. That's just a democracy with extra steps. Correct, the power still lies ultimately with the people. The only difference is a minor adjustment of execution. Well, that would be true if my civics classes hadn't lied to me. You see, the root of republic comes not from rex publica, but, according to every Latin dictionary, according to Wikipedia, according to Bing, according to Google, and according to every other non-civics textbook source, it comes from the words res publica. This one character difference changes everything. I don't know if it was intentional or just caused by lazy textbook writers citing each other's mistakes in a horrible example of the cycle of cytogenesis that is rampant in textbooks these days, but this lie has gone around, despite how easy it is to disprove. But Puffin, that's such a petty change. I mean, it's only one letter. What could such a small, insignificant thing possibly change? The word, it changes the word. Res means an issue or matter. The public matter is the ultimate source of authority in a republic. But what issue, what matter is this thing that the public must share? What matter could possibly be the authority for a government? Well, there are a multitude of meanings layered upon this word, that the affairs of the state are the public concern and not the private concern of kings that the state is an issue for the entire public to consider, the deepest meaning and where the authority lies must be gleaned from its source. These surface-level readings provide no difference from a democracy, and so we must look to the First Republic for our answer. Before the Roman Senate were carved twelve tablets of stone. Upon these stones were written the Roman Code of Laws, the responsibilities of every Roman citizen, and the absolute laws that all were beholden to, regardless of class or creed, power or seat. It was placed in the public square not as a nice art piece, but because it was necessary for every citizen to know their rights and responsibilities, because the code of laws was a matter for the public to keep. The ultimate authority was not the representatives who debated in the Senate, nor the people who voted them in, but the code by which they all, as citizens of Rome, had bound themselves. Today, instead of twelve tables, we have a constitution. Beside the country of Stikmanistan lies the agricultural breadbasket known as Manstikistan. The king of Manstikistan recently was offered one of those things that leaders for thousands of years have looked for, going all the way back to Gilgamesh of old immortality. He may rule over his nation forever, but in exchange for never dying, he will give up the ability to communicate. In preparation for this, he decides to write down the laws he thinks are the absolute mostest importantest things to his people. But Poffin, hush, I know it's not a real word, found among all these laws is the following law. All of my people accused of a crime will receive a fair and public hearing before a judge. Knowing that someone must enforce and interpret these laws, the king forms a council that will regularly be rotated out. But knowing that corrupt men would always seek power provided by sitting on the council, he added the law, My council will never write any new laws, only enforce the ones I have laid out. He then ascends to the throne forever silenced. Fifty years later, a horrible war in Stikmanistan, probably between the people and their lazy turtle-counting king, causes a mass migration of refugees. The council who enforced the laws laid out by the king happened to all be horrible racists against the people of Stikmanistan at this point, ancient grudges and all that, and decide to look for a loophole in taking care of them properly. While the king was a philanthropist who often sent aid to Stikmanistan during the famines that plagued them during the age of the lazy turtle king, and while the king wrote many letters about the importance of watching over everyone, the exact wording of the law was, all of my people will receive a fair hearing. The council quickly decides that the words, my people, must refer to the king's race and not the people living within the king's domain. So they proceed to imprison without trials the Stikmanistanian refugees. A few years later, there is massive political unrest, probably caused by the poor treatment of the Stikmanistanian population in Manstikistan. 
The council finds it hard to keep promoting their agenda, given that they must provide fair trials for these political dissidents, many of whom are Manstikistanian citizens, and thus fall under the defined category of my people that they laid out. The council conspires together in rules that my people also only includes those who agree with the king, and by proxy agree with his council. With that hurdle overcome, they are able to imprison political dissidents without trial, and thus avoid the public embarrassment of being proven wrong in a public trial. But all of this ruling, or <coughs> counseling, seems for naught in the eyes of the council, given that every so often the council rotates and gets new leaders. And sometimes those new leaders disagree with the status quo the council has set up. They decide it has become impossible to enforce the laws without additional bureaucracy to aid in enforcement and in proper processing. The council begins establishing departments and agencies. While there was no law allowing them to delegate such authority, there wasn't a law preventing it either. And while the council may require regular rotation, these agencies need to be professional, so their employees will stay in for a lifelong tenure. And while the council cannot write laws, they do empower their agencies to draft regulations to enforce laws within their domains. You know, because they need to have some sort of power in order to enact the laws. Soon agencies tasked with food safety are writing regulations on how roads must be built because food is shipped in trucks and the safety of the food is paramount. And agencies that were formed to combat the counterfeiting of currency are now acting as the bodyguards to council members and arresting people for trespassing. This is a completely fictional country. Any resemblance of this one agency to the United States Secret Service in either origin or current purpose is entirely coincidental. Unless it's not. And watching over all of this is the Silent King. He technically is the one with the authority. He is still the king, and his word is still law. But because the council has chosen corrupt ways of interpreting and enforcing his laws to enshrine their own powers and push their own agendas, the country is no longer actually following the king's will, the king's rule. This peaceful conquest of the king's government could be considered treason. Since the signing of the American Constitution in 1787, 189 countries have written their own constitutions. Nine quote-unquote contested countries have constitutions written. Hashtag I stand with Taiwan. And 13 dependent territories have constitutions. Over 200 sovereign states use the word republic to describe themselves. Why would so many governors willingly hand over power? So many monarchs, dictators, and theocrats relinquishing power to a higher code of laws. While there certainly is benefit to a codified government, a benefit that otherwise would require hundreds of years of tradition to form, it benefits diplomatic relations because you know who can and can't make treaties and deals. You know what you will and won't be arrested for, even when it's still oppressive, at least you as a diplomat know. It's good for public support because the people know what they can expect from their country, what rights they do and don't have. But it's also good for those in power. A republic, if you can keep it, Franklin said, because a republic is only kept when the public lives up to the public matter. The code of laws isn't a deal made among a mere majority of the country, but a set of both rights and responsibilities that, if a large supermajority of citizens will keep, a republic they will have. In a democracy, if 45% of the public disagree with the will of the majority, the majority will simply enforce their will upon the minority. In a republic, if 45% of the country refuses to keep the code, the republic will fall. There will always be criminals in society who break the laws, but when enough of a society doesn't even know what the code is, or worse, doesn't even know that the code of laws is the king that the people must hold the council to account for, then the council can easily claim that the republic protects you while manipulating and twisting the laws to suit their own needs. The code of laws, the responsibilities of the citizens, and the powers given them can only be acted out by a society that knows the responsibilities and the rights of that code. Republics are popular for leaders because they provide the benefits of stability, but with an uneducated population, they come with only a slight loss of power. I mentioned earlier that I hope that the lie my civics classes taught me was an accident of lazy textbook authors citing each other's mistakes, because the alternative is to believe that there are those who are willfully miseducating the public about the public matter, and that would be treason. When did you last read your constitution? 
Thank you all so much for hanging around until the end. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. I could really use the shares and the subscribers. And uh, we'll see you next time.